I'm just sweating up here. I was being blonde, we'll say, I don't even remember who, who I was. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, lost there, but I thank God for uh, Paul and his ministry. More than kids, I thank God for the parents who minister their children early in the morning uh, to work with them. And that's God. Amen. So this morning, before I go any further, uh, I want to celebrate moms. I want to celebrate you guys. You guys invented a language they're called momisms. You know what momisms are? Put on a cold or you're going to catch oh. a cold or pneumonia. Right? You guys came up with stuff like, don't sit so close to the TV or... Those are momisms. Right? If you don't have something nice to say, don't... Say it. Say it. Oh. You created your own vocabulary. <laughs> Momisms are what runs the world when we're kids. That's all we know. I want to thank God for you this morning. And as we visit the story, before we do that, I want to thank God for my mom for a second. People bear with me uh, for her effort and for her uh, love for her foundation in the faith. And as we go into this week, there's a lot of graduations going on, right? There's a lot of celebration. Pastor was telling us that um, his granddaughter and his son were in some high-level competition over the weekend. We heard mm -hmm. praises from back here of a new family, new growth. We've heard graduations from my niece and other people. Everyone is being blessed. Yeah. Let's Amen. stop for a second and realize that for a minute. But I want to thank God for, in this graduation season, I was thinking, you know, I want to thank God uh, for my mom. And the title of this, ser this, ser this sermon, I guess, is not up there. It's called A Mother's Sacrifice. And let me tell you, where are my young people at? Uh, let me see. I got one. Yeah. Over there. You guys over here. I just want to find out where you're at. Okay, cool. Because this message is for you. Even though it's Mother's Day, I need you to understand something just for the next 30 minutes, not maybe even less. If you could just lend me your ears so I can give you some information that is really valuable, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your son. We thank you for uh, the sacrifice and the work of the cross, God, that makes all this possible, Lord. We thank you for this place of worship, Lord, that we're able to come in here and scream your name and jump and have relationships. We thank you for the gift of relationships, Father. Let us appreciate those relationships, Father. We thank you for the weather. We thank you for the place we live and the freedom that we have. God, today, Lord, we ask one thing, Father. We ask that you help us simplify this message of Hannah, Father, of a mother's sacrifice and what she's willing to do to have the best outcome for her children. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. See, right now, <clears throat> you young people have no idea the things that you go through are for your best. That's the last thing that crosses your mind. The reason I can't do this or the reason I should do this or the reason they ask you to do this, the farthest thing from your mind is because it's what's best for me. That's the last thing that crosses your mind. When really, in a parent's mind, and especially someone who's following the Lord, that's the only thing they're thinking about. And sometimes they'd rather be your friend, but they don't have that option. Amen. They have to be a good parent. My mother was, uh, there's some things that, whenever, you know, every mom has their own thing. My mom, I want to tell you a few things about my mom that I will never forget. Uh, and it's same little quirks that my mom does. My mom, if you leave anything at my house, or her house, should I say, she will write her name on it. <laughs> with the Sharpie. <laughs> it no longer belongs to you. I don't care if your friend let you borrow a nice chest. I don't care if that was your baseball glove. If it stayed there long enough and she found it, it became property of living. You, want, you, you think I'm crazy here? Let me show you my, my guitar cord. It says, living me on it. <laughs> That's my mom. Just in case. And you best know that if you borrowed a pan and you didn't return it, and you were you're washing dishes and ends up seeing the letters in black says living me, you better get that back pretty quick. She ain't gonna forget about that. Those cusses are on us for 25 years. Those are the best ones, right? Those old pots and pans. That's my mom. I remember things like that. Another thing I want to talk about my mom is sacrifice. I'm gonna tell you a little story. After church. 
Uh, when I was growing up, I must have been maybe a Leah's age, Leah and Roy. And uh, after church, you know, on Sunday night, because we went, we went to church twice. Thank you, Jesus. And after the night service, a lot of us, uh, my cousins and my friends would go to McDonald's afterwards. It wasn't an expensive place, but it's because they had the play pins. Y'all remember when McDonald's used to be cool, had a play pin, and used to like avoid your kids for an hour and a half, <laughs> take them home afterwards. Well, they used to go, and, and every now and then we would go, but sometimes we wouldn't be able to. And I couldn't understand this concept of we don't have the money. They wouldn't really even tell me they didn't have the money. They would just say, we can't go. And it was, it, was, it was some sacrifice that, and I learned now that those times where I was upset at them for not being able to go, everybody else gets to go. And I couldn't go. I've learned now to appreciate the times that I did get to go. It wasn't our season at that time. My parents didn't make enough money at the time. And they had bills, but they didn't share those responsibilities with me. They just said, we can't go. That's what their parents do. But mom, mom always found a way. Every morning, I'm not kidding, mom, from probably seventh grade to almost I graduated, probably until I graduated, my mom, um, usually on Monday, was usually the first day, we would leave the house. And by our house was this place called McDonald's. <laughs> and she would call in an order. It was the same every time. We knew it. It was a sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit with, what would we put on it? Jelly. 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 What kind of jelly? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah? They look just like this. Don't worry, I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to get one for everyone. <laughs> When I look at this, I see my mom. Till today, I know how much it was. It was a dollar eight. Sounds cheap, right? Dollar eight. A dollar eight. My mom always had a dollar. She always had change. Did my dad know about it? Probably not. Maybe he did. I don't know. I know he know we didn't. We didn't go every day. <laughs> I know that for a fact. But that's a sacrifice. You know, maybe you couldn't have gone at night with your friends or the night before with your family, but I got something just I'll for you. And when I see, when I see the, the, that, and it's so funny because as much as we don't want to be like our moms, when I go to the menu every time in the morning to order from McDonald's, now as an adult, I still order the same thing that she used to order. I want it, and with jelly. Little things that you'll never forget. Yeah. Another word is, I don't know if they knew, <coughs> but they used to call us lazy bones. Anybody ever called you lazy bones? Yeah. I, I didn't realize just so recently it's in the book of Proverbs. <laughs> yeah, lazy bones. Those people who are idle and lazy and sleeping too late. And my mom and my dad used to call lazy bones. Hey, come on, let's go get up, lazy bones. Let's move. <laughs> Proverbs 5, I believe. Proverbs, I don't want to listen to you. Proverbs 6. Story of somebody who's idle, called lazy bones. <coughs> and lastly, so I can get up on mom, I don't know if because this is for all moms. You guys, you young people, your mother has given up a lot for you. They give up a lot of their ambitions, their dreams, their passions. And they don't regret it because they love being your parents. But they sacrificed. <coughs> and you don't know what sacrifice is until it feels like it's hurting you and you're dying and you want to give more for your kids but you can't that's a sacrifice and that's what I want us to realize tonight on those moments that they tell you we can't do this or we can't go somewhere just know that it's not because they don't want to Amen. it's because they can't sometimes my mother had a junior high education and this week we celebrate education People are graduating, walking stages all across the country. And they're graduating with bachelors and masters and PhDs. And my mother had, now that I can realize it, because see, the word says, I heard, but now I see. 
And now I can see that my mom is an educated woman. In the only school that ever mattered. That's right. The University of Life. And she has a, a bachelor's degree in forgiveness and love. And a master's degree in grace and forgiveness. And a PhD in worship. Let me tell you, that started 70 years ago. For those who don't want to go to school for four and graduate, never dropped a class, never skipped a semester. That's what counts. That's the only thing that counts. Amen. It's a school of life. And I thank God for my mom and my dad too. It's not always so I can't drive my dad. <laughs> but for laying that foundation. Lord, thank you today for coming to see. I've heard it, and now I see how valuable they are. Like you said, they taught you how to pray. They taught you how to read the Bible. What is more valuable than that? Tell me. <laughs> so let's jump into Hannah's story. So Hannah, you guys let me know if it's too hot or too cold. <laughs> Hannah <clears throat> See, we know King David, right? We know King David. I mean, his Amen. life is recorded, is the largest recorded in the Bible. From the day he was, from the very beginning of his life to the end of his life, David's life is so important in the Bible. It is a huge section, more than anyone else, is David. You know what? He, his life is more recorded than anyone in history, even secular. There's nobody recorded more of their life than David. But before you can know David, you need to know Samuel, who found David, who found this little shepherd boy. But before you know Samuel, you need to know his mom. And her name is Hannah. You see how something so small and insignificant can lead into something, into the greatest. And you know who Jesus came from was the lineage of David. Yeah, yeah. So let's dive in back to Hannah's story for a second. Let's look at little insignificant Hannah. My wife read. <coughs> my wife read. Thank you, love, for reading. A story of Elkanah. He had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina has children. In one version it says, has daughters and sons, so it's multiple girls, multiple boys. But Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh, which, by the way, coincidentally means place of rest. To worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heavens and armies of the tabernacle. The priests and the Lord at the time were the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions to the meat to Penina and each of her children. And although he loved Hannah, he would only give her one choice portion. And some of your versions, it's going to say a double portion, right? Amen. Because he loved her. He loved Hannah. And let me tell you something, guys, I, I, please. <laughs> Polygamy was accepted in these days, okay? Having more than one wife. How many know that was never going to work? You can barely, you know, get along with your one wife. But see, you got to understand, before we judge Elkanah, he, Hannah's his first wife. We can tell because the Bible says her name first. So Hannah's the first wife, but they can't have children. And this is a huge deal. Because there is no 401k, there's no savings, there's no retirement. The future of Elkanah and his whole family, including Hannah, is based on their children. So he takes another wife. And her name is Penina. Her name just sounds mean, doesn't she? Penina? Penina. <laughs> anyway. So he has to have another wife. And she begins to bear children. And I'm sure this tears and tears at Hannah, who he loves. But you can tell that Elkanah loves her because he gives her the double portion or the choice portion. It's like the choice piece of meat, the big piece of chicken, you know what I'm saying? Here's the big piece of chicken. Because the Lord had given her no, no children. 
And but Penina, this mean lady, would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. And one of your verses will say the Lord closed her womb. Why would you close the womb? Lord. Let me tell you, I'll cut right into something real quick. Anything that you're going through, anything that you're struggling with that you can't understand that you have no control over, and if you stay in the will of God, it's so that God will get the glory. People will see the glory through this situation. Because that's what's going to happen here for Hannah. She's going constantly in obedience, going to the temple every year and all the way because I'm assuming in my mind, there's, there's, there's two wives, so I'm pretty sure they're as far as they can be from each other. But on this day, they have to go together. And as they travel to the temple to pray and to worship and to give thanks, Penina pokes at Hannah, trying to show her how better she is. Can you imagine what it's like going to worship God? And trying to say, why? Why not me? Why haven't I had what I needed? Lord, you know me. You know what I want. Year after year, the same would happen. And Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tavern. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. How many of you guys know when you get really mad, you don't even get hungry? You can tell, right, when something's wrong with somebody? They haven't eaten. Hannah, place your hand in the situation. And of course, Elkanah would say, Why are you crying, Hannah? Why aren't you eating? You know, don't be downhearted because you don't have any children. You have me. Isn't that better than ten sons? No. That's the answer to that. No, you're not better than ten sons. I just need one. This is her, her attempt to cling to God. Let's read on here. On verse 9, it says, Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. There's an action. You ever heard of an action word that says, like, I put my foot down? What does that mean when you put your foot down? That means that's it, right? Put my foot down. Here, this action word says, stood up. Here, Hannah makes a decision. Church, I'm telling you this morning. If there's anything, because you see, Hannah suffered a lack of barrenness. You know what barrenness means? All it means is lacking or a void of. It could be anything. You say, well, best, I, I, you know, I'm not a woman and, and I, I don't need a child. No, but there's something that you do need. There's something that there is lacking. There's something that you want that you have not gotten. I don't care if it's health. I don't care if it's a breakthrough. Whatever it is, there is void. And Hannah makes a decision. She stands up and she makes a decision to go. She got up and she went to pray. We live in a society, I see it all the time, and I've said this before, where a shooting happens or something happens and there's people out there and they're frustrated and they're mad. Key word, frustrated and they're mad. And they have signs that say, Quit, the prayer doesn't do anything. We need to do something. That is incorrect. Sometimes all you need to do is pray. In the situation, she prays to the Lord. And as she was praying, Eli, which is the overseer of the place, the priest, I guess, sees her lips moving, and he thinks she's drunk. You ever been in that much anguish? And she says, says here that she was crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord and she made this vow. Be careful what you pray to, what you ask God for and what you promise to God. But she asked him here, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to you, his hair will never be cut. Another version says a razor will never touch his head. That's a promise. That's desperation. But that's specific. It's a prayer that is specific. You hear that? Guys, and I know we pray for each other here in our church and we pray for our family, but, but God's not in the business of, oh, be with so-and-so and be with so-and-so and help so-and-so. No! Help him with his addiction. Help him break the pornography. Help me with my lust. Help me with this. Be specific in your prayer. Hannah says, if you give him to me, I will do this, this. I won't do this. And he knows you mean business now. He knows this isn't just a cover. Will be yours his entire lifetime. 
And as a sign that if you dedicate to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. You know, as Jessica and I are in the season of our lives, as we're expecting, it's a scary season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's like, oh, you're so happy. Yeah, until I start thinking about the doctor's appointments. And the doctors are great, and they tell you everything that can happen. And if you get a call from me, this means that. And we're testing for this, this, this. I say, Lord, I didn't even know that happened. And we are happy. We expect God to, to do whatever he's going to do. And we, we accept his will. But I can tell you already, we've had that discussion. We offered him up to the Lord from the day we found out he was pregnant. We said, whatever it is, Lord, it's yours. Because in our care, we will mess things up. We can't. We can't even get through this pregnancy without you. And I don't know, but let me tell you something. Mother's Day in this place for me was one of the hardest things in my life because I was like, oh, can I, is it, am I not good enough for 10 sons? And I watched my wife, right there with my mother-in-law sitting, and I stood there next to her, and year after year after year, as we honored mothers as they stood here, I prayed, Lord, why? Why can't you know that's all that's going to make her happy? <coughs> You know that's going to fix things in my family. I want to see your glory. I want to see it every year, every year. And you guys are amazing. The mothers in this church make her feel, make us feel very welcome and loving. And she's come up here a few times. But I stood there every Mother's Day. And I can confess to you, church, because we're transparent, that that was the worst day of the year for me. Especially last week. I went to some crazy extents last year to try to mean something so that our heart would be full. Because y'all know we have dogs. If you don't know, we have dogs, we have dogs. And, and we put this thing together and we made it with flowers and it was custom made. You couldn't buy it, but it's not a baby. And she's gracious and she wouldn't complain and she wouldn't whatever. She would just move forward. So I can associate myself with Hannah in this situation. But she prayed couple of weeks as we were going through XO, before we were going to XO, we were in this church and it was, things were getting tough in here and I was like, Lord, why are things so tough in here? My gosh, you know our hearts, we're here all the time, but in those moments, I found myself praying a lot more than I would normally, and he says, well, that's maybe sometimes why I get things tough, so what do you mean? I said, Lord, you know what? If something is wrong in my body, in any of my body, fix it. If anything is wrong in Jessica's body, fix it, God. Amen. You see how specific that comes when you're in desperate, when you're in desperation? Fix it. I need you to fix this. I don't want to go to another Mother's Day like this. Specific. So as he was in the, she was praying, her lips weren't moving, and Eli thinks he's been drunk. And he tells her those things, he says, why must you come here drunk? You need to throw away your rhyme. You need to, church, we're going to learn two things real valuable here. Number one is, where is she? She's in the temple. She's worshiping. And some of us, some of you who are hurting and who you're coming here to the temple, and, and some of us maybe, we don't even understand why maybe you should be worshiping this way. You forget what we say. Amen. The fact is you're here. And for us that are critiquing or, or saying, well, why do you worship this way or why do you don't, we don't know what it took you just to get in the door. Hannah had so much on her plate that day. Amen. And she came in here. And how dare we be a moral police to how you worship? We don't understand it. Eli didn't understand it either. He said, oh, you're drunk. See how he was, he was trying to be mean. He was just, he didn't understand what she was going through. She says, uh, I'm not drunk. I'm just discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think that I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of anguish and sorrow. In that case, says Eli, gets the, gets the, the he says, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant the request you asked of him. She's Amen. still, Thank you, Lord. she's still under submission of this man who is her birth. And he's receiving the blessing. He sees now, he gives her the benefit, and he blesses her. And she leaves. Then she went back. 
Oh, she says, okay, thank you, sir. She exclaimed. She went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. What does that mean? That means she began to believe. She began to believe that the work that he had said was true. I'm going to be wrapping up here today. I just want you to know that through this moment of difficulty, she kept on every year going to the temple, going to the temple, going to the temple. Through the difficult times, no matter what was going on, still being still following, going to the temple, going to the temple, continually, slowly. I'm moving forward, but I'm going to the temple in faith. I'm going to the temple. Let me tell you what happens when you go to the temple. Eventually, when it's God's timing, He will be waiting. Amen. Time is way. That's right. Amen. Let's wrap this story up. So Samuel, the entire family got up early. Can we say early? Y'all oh, hate that word. <laughs> the entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Now she's dragging everybody. Let's learn this church. She's dragging all her family. Once they returned to home to Ramah, Elkanah slept with Hannah, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave a birth to his son. His name was Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. That's what Samuel means. No longer, the womb was no longer closed. The next year, Elkanah went and his family went on the annual trip to offer sacrifice to the Lord. But Hannah didn't go this time. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. See, at first you think, oh man, she's not going to the temple. Right? We criticize her. Go, hey, now that you got your blessing, you're not going to the temple. But she says, wait. She says, wait until the boy is weaned. Then I will take him to the tabernacle and I will leave him there with the Lord permanently. Wow. Talk about a mother's sacrifice. Whatever you think is best, Elkanah, like a smart man would. Stay here for now, and may the Lord keep you, and you keep your promise to the Lord. So she stayed at home and nursed the boy till he was weaned approximately three years old. I know it's a long time, for, but that's, that's kind of the way it went. Um, when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle. They brought a three-year-old bull to sacrifice with some flour and wine. They sacrificed the bull, and they brought it to Eli. And then she says, sir, do you remember me? She tells Eli, and I'm the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy. He has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. Amen. Amen. Lord. She didn't go over and say, you see, you got it all messed up. No, she says, here. Here's the boy. Here's the boy. And I give it to you my whole life. Let me tell you something, church. When you know the importance of bringing your kids to church? Do you have any idea? Amen. Because Samuel, at the age of three, he starts to learn things. He starts learning things. So if he was anywhere else, he probably could have been a great smith. Or what do they call the people that make the knives? Blacksmith. blacksmith. He could have been a great blacksmith. Or he could have been a great fisherman. If they'd have left him with some fishermen. But no, he was left in the presence of the Lord at the temple. So Samuel begins to acquire these skills underneath the direction of this man and with the presence of God and starts becoming this person. I'm sure he messed up and he was a kid, but he, he was worked on. And that's the importance of, of us bringing our children to church. And you want to give them back to the church. Thank you. Let me tell you, you know how many people I've run into over the last few years that are young, now adults that would tell me, and I'm sure that's who he is, my dad, I've been there a few times when it was my dad who didn't say, man, because of what you said to me when I was younger, I, I, that stayed with me. And I might have done whatever, but I'm back in the church now. Amen. And I'm serving God. You know how many people do, have done that? Let me tell you, when you bring your, your, your children to church, there's people here that can pour into them. They have. I know it. I've seen it. Amen. We wouldn't even have had a wedding if not for half the people at this church. That's what happens when you bring them to the temple. Mm -hmm. To conclude, I just want to finish this sentence here. In her prayer, here's Hannah's prayer. The was Hannah's prayer. 
my heart rejoices in the Lord, not in Samuel. Amen. You clear? Mm -hmm. My heart rejoices in the Lord, not my son. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have the answer for my enemies. But not enough. <laughs> I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. Beside, there is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. So stop acting so proud and so haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows what we have done. He will judge your actions. The bow of the mighty is now broken. Those are our enemies. And those who stumbled are now strong. That was her. Those who were well fed are now starving. And those who were starving are now full. The childless woman has seven children. And the woman with many children wastes away. The Lord gives both death and life. Amen. He brings Thanks some to down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and the others rich. He brings down some and he lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He even sets them upon princesses and he places them in the seats of honor. For the all of the earth is the Lord's and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. His thunder, he thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives the power to his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. And then Elkanah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. And the boy served by assisting Eli the priest. Samuel. Later on, people of Israel get all crazy. They want a king. So they get Saul. Saul gets quickly fired. And here goes Samuel to go find King David. And now we're back to the story of Jesus. But Hannah's prayer, church, Hannah's sacrifice, Hannah's commitment, her heart during that wait. That waiting period when we're, we're feeling bored, that, that waiting period when things aren't happening, we have two options. That's either to <clears throat> be bitter and anger and get anxiety, or we have hope, faith, trust, and worship. She worshiped the Lord. Hannah is showing us how to stay cool under pressure. I know some of you pick on you, some of y'all push your buttons, and I know you just want to knock the living lights out of people. But I'm telling you, you have to be like Hannah and continue to go to the temple. Keep your cool. Pray for what you need. She didn't pray so that Penina would get hit by lightning. She prayed for what she really needed and what she wanted. And then when she got what she wanted, she offered it back to the Lord. And that is a sacrifice. Mothers know all about sacrifice. When you have something, don't think it's because it's because they've gone without. That's why you have something. Because they have pulled back on their own to give you something. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this uh, privilege, Father. Father, we thank you for the story of Hannah. And Father, we get tired of these penines, Lord. And they're just around all the time, God. But Lord, thank you for giving us this, this vision, this direction, this instruction of Hannah and how specific her prayer must have been, Lord. And to teach us to be specific and to wait on you, Lord, but to believe and when, not if, but when your prayer is answered, Lord, let us give you the worship you deserve, Father, and that we take joy in you, not the gift, God, that we got, but in the giver of the gifts. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to see, Lord, that you are the giver. And, Father, that we offer ourselves. We can't offer our children. Some of us, we offer our children up to you, Father God. But if we don't have the children and they're already on their own, Lord, we offer ourselves. Yes, Lord. Help. Use us, God. Use us the way you want us to. We're better off in your hands, Lord, than in our own. I love you, Father. I play a special blessing right now, Lord. I pray an anointing on these women that are here, God. Anybody that can hear my voice, Lord, that today, Father God, they walk out here, Father, knowing you, seeking you, with the questions, Father God, knowing that you are the answer and the way to happiness, to love, to joy, Father. Be with them every day, in the morning, when they get up on their ways to school, on 
on their ways to work, wherever they do, with their children, Father, put a hedge of protection around these women, Lord, and lift them up, God. Let them be a light to you, Father God, for other women to see that they keep coming to the temple. They keep praying. They keep coming to the temple, and God continues to bless us every time. Lord, we love you. I thank you for this message. Forgive us our sins. Forgive me if I said anything that was off or wrong, Lord. I don't want to do that. Forgive us all our sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 I want to end with a song.